All right. We're here today for the Korean War Legacy uh, Foundation's Korean War Veteran Digital Memorial. My name is Don Blake. I'm the interviewer. I have here in front of me Mr. William Fox. And I want to start by asking you, Mr. Fox, what is your full name? It's William T. Fox. William T. Fox, great. Uh, when and where were you born? I was born in Brooklyn, New York, June 3rd, 1928. Wow. And current city and state, where do you live? Dallas, Texas. Okay, at Dallas, Texas. And who are your parents? Uh, well, William and uh, Dorothy Fox. Okay, and uh, um, what were their occupations during uh, during your uh, during your time during the service? Okay, uh, my father was a uh, factory representative for in the hosiery industry. My mother started out being his secretary, and they finally got married. They wound up getting married, uh, so she didn't really work. Well, mm -hmm. I guess she did work with my brother and I when my father was at work. Okay, so it sounds like you have some siblings. Yeah, one brother. You have one brother? And he was in Korea the same time I was. In really? Okay, that's very interesting. So, what was his name? Tom, Thomas Fox. Thomas Fox? Okay, excellent. Um, and, uh, um, and and did he serve at the same time that, that you did with you? Did he go in, you know, at the same at the same time and you guys he, served in the same branch? He went, in, uh, well, he went in the Army a little bit after I did. Okay. Uh, I went to ROTC, so I came out as a second lieutenant. He didn't take ROTC, but he was drafted as soon as he graduated. So he served as an enlisted man. Uh, fortunately, he was around Seoul, where there was not that much combat. Mm -hmm. uh, I was further north, where there was a lot of combat. We did re meet one time in Seoul. I got a pass to my back. We had a reunion. Oh, and we got drunk as skunks, of course. But <laughs> <laughs> we had a good time. That's right. That's right. It sounds amazing. What were you doing before you entered the service? Well, I graduated from Lehigh University in June of 1950, and I got a job with uh, the Lambert Company, which sold Listerine uh, products and prophylactic hairbrushes and combs and things like that. And I was in their training program for about six months and then uh, signed a territory in Peoria, Illinois for six months. Uh, I was in the, uh, I can't remember the name of the unit, but it was the uh, um, Army Reserve. Okay. So I was on active, I was an active reservist, mm -hmm. in other words. So when I went into the Army, I had two years behind me of uh, reserve service. Okay, and you, we had said before in the discussion that you were actually from New York, so how, how long had you lived in New York before you came here to Texas? Well, when I was 18 I went to school, mm -hmm. and I went in Peoria, then the Army, and then came back and got married in 55, We've been married 60 years. Congratulations. Uh, and we lived in New York for... Uh, Three years, I think, and I was transferred to. Uh, oh, when I came back, I got a job with IBM. Okay. And to, to, uh, came an IBM uh, salesman, and uh, in the electronic accounting machine division, which is now the data processing division. And I went from there to Washington, and then from Washington back to New York, but we lived in Connecticut for six years and then came out to Dallas. Been in Dallas 45 years now. Wow. Again, we're glad to have you here. No, I'm a cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, were, you in, uh, were you in any other conflicts or wars besides the Korean War? No. No? Okay. And uh, were you enlisted or drafted? No, I was on TC. You are upright. So, was, so okay. And, uh, um, were you, uh, at, well, again, you said, did you receive any specialized training? If so, you know, uh, you know, if so, what kind of training did you have once you, once you got into basics and you were, you know, and, and you got going, were you selected to do anything in specific no, once you were there? No, no, okay. uh, in those days, we were training troops, so mm -hmm. uh, you can just follow. I went to, uh, went to Fort Leonard, Missouri, and then, uh, Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I get the so you said you were stationed at Fort Hood, Missouri? Yeah, 
then I went to the inter in infantry officers training school at Fort Benning, Georgia. Mm -hmm. And then from there I went to Korea. Okay. What was training like for you? Did you did you end up you know, did you end up having great camaraderie with the same men and those and those same men were the ones that went with you when you fought in Korea? No, uh, this uh, <clears throat> this wasn't unit training. This was individual training. Okay. okay. And where we well learned to lead troops. Okay. Uh, ROTC was basic. I was in school. He went to school. Mm -hmm. So we knew the uh, the basics of uh, infantry, how you use it, and so on and so forth. Now we got to do it. Right. Uh, lead uh, lead troops into various combat situations. Okay. And uh, um, it's it, it, it obviously you were in the army, and uh, mm -hmm. it uh, and about uh, you know tell me something about the unit that you were assigned to, unit or company or any uh, any specific regiment that you were assigned to. Do you mean in Korea or? Just yes, once you once you got to Korea, you know you were assigned to or you were you were led you were called to lead a group. Uh, yeah. What was the what was the name of your group, regiment, or company that you were affiliated with? Okay, when I got to Korea, I was assigned to the. Well, I was in the Seventh Division, Seventeenth mm -hmm. Infantry Regiment, First Battalion, Company B. Wow. I was, <laughs> so I was a, a platoon leader, which is. Uh, you know, one step above uh, a worm, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, second lieutenants were uh, uh, well. There was a lot of second lieutenants that came and went, uh, and they usually went feet first. There was a high uh, rate of uh, uh, casualties. Mm -hmm. uh, in, 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 you know. In the lower grades, right, absolutely, um, and uh, um, I, I know that you refer to your specific job or our uh, specialty in uh, in leading the infantry. Uh, what city or camp did you actually fight in Korea? Uh, sitting in like city. A, a, any city or camp, like you know, once you once you arrived there, where were you assigned to? Um, different parts that you moved to. Um, so where did you originally start when you were actually uh, given the assignment to uh, okay, to go to when, Korea? Uh, when I got to Korea, the 17th Infantry at that time was around Chowan, Chowan Valley, mm -hmm. which was a classic invasion route into uh, Seoul. We stayed pretty much in that area. I was with the 7th Division the whole time I was there, and the 17th Infantry, of course. Uh, we were in the, uh, we were kind of in the center of Korea where the uh, 38th parallel goes up and then comes down, and that's called the uh, Iron Triangle. Uh, mountains up there were uh, Old Baldy, Triangle Hill, Jane Russell, uh, Poor Chop. Those are pretty much the uh, locations we were in the whole time we were there. Mm -hmm. The the Korean War was interesting in that it was a two-part war. The first part was the Blitzkrieg, when the Chinese came in and pushed the, well, the North Koreans came in and pushed the South back, then we went back up, and then we went back down as far as the 38th and kind of steadied there. And that's that's called the Sitzkrieg. <laughs> Didn't go to be sat. That was during the uh, negotiating period, which started about after, you know, shortly after the first year of the war. They started negotiating and picked the 38th parallel. That was selected for them at the end of the Second World War. And that was the kind of where we were going to be. We tried to get a little bit north to the 38th parallel. They tried to get a little bit south of it. We actually got about 12, I guess about 12 miles north to the 38th parallel, and that's pretty much where it is today. Right, correct. The uh, time I was there, what the, what the battle was for two years, was actually jockeying for position. We would try and go and get some hill and hold it, and they'd try and get some hill and hold it, and they'd try and get it back, we'd try and get it back. It was a lot of back and forth. 
on porch up here, which got some notoriety. There's actually three battles, and it, all three battles were very costly. And it was just a little piece of land that looked something like a poor job. Mm -hmm. And we were on the end of it. Uh, and that was, uh, we had one of our fellows, uh, I can't remember his name. I don't remember his name here in just a second. Oh, he was from West Point. I met him uh, in Philadelphia doing the IC4A track meet and uh, track beats. Mm -hmm. And he was a very nice fellow. Oh, God. I probably pray for him every day with the rest of the guys. Richard, Richard. At any rate, he won the Medal of Honor on Paul Job oh, wow. for his act actions there. He was quite a fellow. Yeah. And what was the camaraderie like in your unit? Was it was the morale pretty high at the start? And, and you know, did you... You guys seem to the bond that you shared, and and tell tell me what like the camaraderie was in the unit okay. that you led. The army made a big mistake, I think, or well, the services made a big mistake in rotation, not rotation of units, but rotation of individuals. In the Second World War, you were assigned to a company, you went to basic training with that company, and you went overseas with that company, like in the picture uh, about the paratroopers. Uh, Tank was the name of it. The Band of Brothers. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, where they started out together and they stayed together. Mm -hmm. It was different in Korea. People were, so after the first year, the people were sent over individually and sent back individually. There was a point system in effect. Uh, when you amassed 40 points while you were sent home. Mm -hmm. So the camaraderie while you were there was good, but you never got to know anyone too well because either he or you would be leaving. Right. And that was, I think that was a big mistake, rather than having units serve together. Right. Individuals were it's still individuals, and while we made friends, you made friends over there that, uh, you know, I still talk to some of the guys I was with way back when, 50 years ago. That's great. Uh, not many, not mm -hmm. many more, unfortunately. So it was more individual camaraderie than unit camaraderie. Okay. The 17th Regiment, though, was somewhat unique in that the 17th Regiment was a, a, um, a there was, I know, not an individual, what are you going to say? It was a regular army unit that stayed together. Uh, it was in the Indian Wars, it was in the River, in the uh, Civil War, and mm -hmm. First, Second, Third, not the Third, First and Second World Wars. Right. Uh, so that was a, a unique organization. They still uh, have reunions. I'm still in touch with people in the 17th Infantry. Okay. I don't know much about the 30th or 31st, which were the other two mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, regiments that were assigned to the 7th Division. Uh, the 7th Division had been activated, and now it's being reactivated again. Mm. Uh, I guess to go in the Middle East somewhere. Right. Okay. Um, what memories of your major experiences of battle or events can you recall? Um, what memories of your major experiences of battles or events do you recall? Uh, let's see. It was uh, oh, a couple of battles we were in where we took hills. Hill 246, I think was its number. But it didn't have a name in it, a number. They don't, or the mountain. And why did they uh, name that? Why did they name them that? I mean, like, why did they give them numbers? It was just, just locations in terms of, you know, like longitude and latitude, and so the number was given? I mean, no, how? No, the how number the was uh, on a map, a geographic map mm -hmm. of Korea, and they were elevation numbers. Oh, okay. The height of the hill. Okay, got it. All right. So they were all different, easy to find. Mm -hmm. So Hill 246 was a particular hill. Okay. Uh, Old Baldy was called that because it was bald. <laughs> it was just, it, all, there was no vegetation left. It was completely stone. Because of the elevation? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, because of... Uh, How cold it was? No, because of artillery. Oh, Weapons. yes. She, okay. <laughs> I'm sure just wiping it off like a constant haircut. It was just wiped off. Mm -hmm. There was more artillery 
fired in the second world in, in the Korean War than the Second World War in both theaters, the Atlantic and the Pacific theater together. There was more artillery fired in Korea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any specific artillery that you you know that you knew was coming in on a on a continual basis? You know, whether it was the specific bombs being dropped or artillery being shot. What was what was what was the weaponry? The you know, I guess not the weapon of choice, but you know what you saw more in terms of battlefield, like what was being used? Okay, the Chinese used bazookas because mm -hmm. uh, they shot over the hills. Right. Uh, they had a few uh, cannons and things like that that mm -hmm. they got from the Russians, uh, which they got from the United States. We had some of our own artillery shooting back at us. Mm -hmm. uh, we used recoilless rifles. We had a lot of good artillery. We had naval artillery uh, that would uh, help us on the shores, um, and we had a lot of bazookas too. Okay. I guess the weapon I remember the most is the M1 rifle, which I carried, uh, and the bazookas. Okay. Well, back to uh, back to the question. I I we I. I got you sidetracked easy about your major experiences or battle, uh, battles. You were talking about the hill, 246. You were talking about the specific hill, you know, the one yeah, that y'all called I remember about. that because mm -hmm. that's where I was wounded. Okay. Uh, I say that in that I didn't even know I was wounded. Uh, it was, uh, I stopped, well, we were attacking up the hill. We wanted to take the hill uh, for location, I guess. Uh, we never really knew why we were going anywhere except they told us to do it. Uh, we were on we were on the way up, about two thirds of the way up, and of course the Chinese were firing at us with bazookas, and uh, there was a lot of stuff flying around. A fellow in front of me fell down. He was one of my men. I dropped I dropped down to pick him up. We got up. We, he wasn't badly hurt. <clears throat> we started back up the hill and all of a sudden boom in front of us. Another shell went off, knocked us both flat. But we got up and uh, he was wounded more in the upper body, but he was still mobile. So we made it to the top of the hill, settled in, and uh, finally the uh, Chinese retreated and we, were, we had taken our objective. In the uh, cleanup stage, where you kind of get rearranged and reorganized, mm -hmm. expecting them to go back, uh, medic stopped by and said, Lieutenant, let me bandage you up your wound. You got blood on you. I said, What's well, on mine? That's from Charlie, so and so. He said, No, no, that's from you. It's coming out of your body. I said, Really? <laughs> he said, Oh my God, <laughs> help me. <laughs> Send me home. I was forced in, I was wearing a flat jacket, a, you know bulletproof vest, so to speak, mm -hmm. and most of it hit me in the upper chest. And the jacket was wiped out, but it didn't really get to me, except on the areas where the jacket and the cover, right. like the, the neck and the shoulder. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of shrapnel on there, which the medic actually picked out. Yeah. So I never had to, you know, leave the hill. And strangely enough, uh, after I got married for, for a number of years, my wife would find little pieces of metal coming out of my neck. Oh my uh, goodness. They finally all came out, I guess, after about uh, three or four years. Oh my goodness. But some pieces were kind of big, but they were mainly small pieces. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Well, for sure you'd have to be careful whenever you'd go to an airport that <laughs> they check for metal. You're like, uh, it's, it's in me, not on me, okay? <laughs> Well, I just had to be careful shaving too, because I. That's true. I piece. didn't even think about that either. So yeah, it's kind of built-in King Gillette razor right there coming yeah, right out. Right. So yeah. just just kind of sharpen it, you know, a little bit, and you'll be good. So, um, now, did you ever see any action on the front line? I mean, I know that you were talking about taking over the hill, but you know, with you being infantry, it seems like you definitely would be right in the heart of everything. So well, that was the front line, right? So, um, and. Uh, uh, when you saw combat, um, you, you obviously you witness you know destruction and you see casualties. Um, d describe you know describe if there's any you know stories that you wish to share or you know what that's like um, you know having seen it firsthand being in, you know in the infantry. 
I, I don't really know how to answer you. Uh, well, what, what do you, what are you okay. trying to get at? There? Well, just you know, if if you if you've wis it, you know witnessing destruction and with and witnessing casualties, um, you know, um, seeing that uh, firsthand, um, you know. To, to the person that you're either, you know, uh, you know, in, in battle itself at the enemy or, you know, some of your men, just, you know, you can describe a, a, a moment that you, you know, an event that took place where, you know, there, there was, like you were talking about, cleanups before and after, caring for the wounded, um, you know, you've witnessed it firsthand. So could you describe in your own words what, you know, witnessing destruction and, and casualties is like? Well, where we were and what we were doing, there wasn't really much destruction. Okay. What had been there had been destroyed. Okay. Uh, we were just on the terrain itself, uh, mainly on uh, a mountain uh, and in the valleys. Uh, the 38th parallel is mountainous territory all across Korea. And of course, where are there are mountains, there are valleys. And we occupied both the top and the bottom. Uh, the action usually took place on the top of the mountain where they were trying to get it, we were trying to hold it, or vice versa. Mm -hmm. We were trying to get it and they were trying to hold it. A good example of that would be Fork Chop Hill, where it was a decent observation point. It had no real military value other than it's an observation point, where there was a lot of combat and a lot of casualties. Uh, we lost a lot of casualties in the Blitzkrieg phase of the operation where there were troops were moving in that it's hard to pick up a, a wounded man and carry him back mm -hmm. when you're going back as fast as you mm -hmm. can. So, And some casualties just couldn't be moved. Yeah. So they were, they were either killed or captured. Yeah. Uh, when they were friends of yours, uh, you, you felt terrible, but you had to do what you were supposed to yeah, no keep on doing. Mm -hmm. So, were you ever a prisoner of war? No. No. Okay. Um, did you receive any medals or honors for your service? Yeah, I got the uh, Broad Star and the Purple Heart. Excellent. And then the usual, I was there medals. Okay. And how was the how was the Bronze Star earned? Uh, that was uh, early in my career, so to speak. Shortly after I got there. I was, as I said, I was the, uh, well, I didn't say, I was a first lieutenant and I was a weapons company, a weapons platoon commander in our company. So I was stationed in the middle of our line. Pardon me, we had an observation post uh, on the top part of the mountain, which we had dug in and uh, put a top on it so you could see out and the enemy couldn't see you we thought. But they knew exactly where we were, just like we knew where they were. Well, it, you're not fighting all the time. There are periods of rest right. and quiet. One during, during one period of rest, it was uh, kind of like twilight. Our company, uh, our platoon medic, said, uh, Lieutenant, I'm going up to the observation post to take a look. So okay. And off he went. Uh, he had he he got my sweater earlier in the day. He was cold, so we said, "Can I borrow your sweater?" I'm going to go ahead. So we put it on. That was that. When he got up there, the wound he received when well, actually blew his head off. Uh, they shot a 57 right every colors shell. We figured uh, later on right into the observation post and destroyed it. Now, unfortunately, Jesse was in there and he was destroyed with it. He, you said he was decapitated, is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Well, they shot this as part of an attack they mm -hmm. were making. They were coming at us. So I grabbed the weapon and got in front of the observation post and started shooting, which is what you do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So uh, that was what I got my medal for, being in an exposed position while they were trying to remove the wound. And, you know, you don't even think about that. It's, what you train to do, you do it. When I had heard um, from uh, the the previous, uh, um, uh, you were giving me um, um, 
the talk to the students uh, um, for the Telemerica program, and he would give it. You said that letters were being sent back because the student had mentioned something about communication back at home, and uh, um, you had said that uh, uh, that there was a story that led to your parents. Uh, you know, with the sweater, because, you know, I remember even recalling as a child that my grandmother would sew my name into the sweater. So tell us a story about, uh, you know, Jesse having worn the sweater and uh, the fear factor that your parents ended up getting the letter. So tell me about that. Well, uh, when Jesse was evacuated, uh, he was sent back to the Unicorp Graves Registration where they try to identify the uh, soldier. Well, having been hit where he was hit, his uh, dog tags were gone, and they, uh, but, it, so, but the sweater was still there, and they saw his name on it, and they knew the unit he was from, of course. So the, you, that guy, William T. Fox, was in that unit, and they knew my mother was a brilliant partner, my parents' name and address. Well, they first got a uh, telegram saying I was missing in action. And uh, that, of course, upset them. Mm-hmm. Then I got a subsequent telegram saying that, uh, not that I was missing, missing, but that I had been killed. So, excuse me a second. Mm-hmm. Get a drink away. So, of course, my parents got all excited about that. <laughs> Imagine that. Wow. Excited is probably not the right word. I'm sorry to say. <laughs> but fortunately, immediately after that telegram, they got another telegram saying I was okay. Mm-hmm. And how yeah. how long in between do, do the letters come? You know, whenever uh, you know when between you getting letters out in the field versus parents being you know acknowledged that whatever is happening to their son uh, um, or family members, like how fast is the correspondence during this time period? That varied. Uh, quite a bit because there were times where we were they didn't have enough room to take back letters. We'd, we'd, we'd write a letter, we'd go in a letter bag ready to mm-hmm. be shipped back. But sometimes there just wasn't time or uh, the availability of transportation to bring the letter right. bag either back to be sent or the ones that were sent to be sent up to us. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, because they have to consider safety and they have to consider, you know, all the components before, you know, before making the move to go pick up the letters and bring them back. Yeah, but like right. you said, that it wasn't constant, you know, siege. It was, you know, there were times where you had the moments to be able to, to ride and, and to, you know, to yeah, right. refuel and resupply. So, yeah, um, there was a, a time there where, uh, oh, I guess three weeks or so had passed. I don't remember exactly now, where my parents hadn't received any letters from them even though I wrote them and they were in the bag. And my mother got hold of our uh, congressman who got hold of our uh, uh, set, hold of someone in the army who got hold of, got hold of my <laughs> division commander, battery commander, <laughs> right, right on down. <laughs> One day I was just sitting down minding my own business in our little hole in the ground. A uh, runner came up from Dine headquarters, no, Regimental headquarters. Get back to the regiment, they want to talk to you right away. Oh my God, what do they do? So I got back there and went to see the uh, S2, no, S3, and he said, Fox, I want you to write a letter home. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what are you talking about? He said, we got a letter from your mother. <laughs> Where are you? Why were you weren't writing? Oh, wow. I said, my God, I was writing and had it in your bail pig. Yeah, somewhere. right, right. What mom wants, mom gets, right? Right, so, <laughs> so I wrote another letter. Oh, wow. Well, when you received this, you know, you will probably have gotten all five or six of the letters that I, that I had sent intentionally. Um, when and where were you when the war ended? I was home. I was back home. Okay. I was on the ship uh, on the high seas coming back home when the uh, uh, armistice was signed. Okay. Okay. And uh, um, and what what year was that that you were released to go back home? Well, you said it was the same year, so it was 1953. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. And uh, um, in the summer. In, in the summer itself. Okay. Um, did uh, uh, obviously your family was very excited for you to for you to come back. Um, how did your community, you know, in your own neighborhood and communities alike, 
respond to your return? Well, people were glad to see me. There was no, we weren't welcomed home as war heroes or anything like that. Like in the Second World War, when the guys came back, there was, you know, big parties and things mm -hmm. like that. No one cared about Korea. We just came back home and a few of the neighbors said, oh, good, good to see you again. That was about it. Um, how did you do, how did you readjust to civilian life? Like once you came back, did you take some time off? Did you, you know, jump right back into what you were doing before you left? Well, when I came back, I had two weeks leave, I think. Mm -hmm. And then I went back to uh, Camp Atterbury, Indiana. I still had some time to serve. Okay. They were closing down, I can't remember the name of the division, but they were closing down Camp Atterbury. Okay. So I was back there during the closure, and then I was discharged. Uh, my time was up in, uh, let's see, I think it was September. Of, of, of 1953. Hmm? Oh, you're talking September of 1953. Right, yeah, Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, have you, uh, you you did say before you, that you had remained in contact or reunited with fellow veterans. Um, if so, who? Can you remember any of the men that you know you still continue to keep staying in contact with that were from the from the uh, battalion group that you were affiliated with? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, who Floyd, are you? Uh, from Floyd Harden is one of them. Uh, what was he today? Oh, my memory is gone. <sighs> no, he was my sergeant. Okay. Anyway. All right. Um, are you a member of, of any veteran organizations? Yeah, a member of the Korean War Veterans Association. Okay. And then the Military Order of the World Wars Association. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, uh, whenever you whenever you came out of the war, did you receive any of the GI Bill uh, benefits? Uh, and if so, how did the GI Bill benefits impact your life? Okay, the uh, one GI Bill benefit I received that uh, I took was the housing. Oh, the housing. Okay. And uh, when we bought our first house, okay. uh, I haven't needed any more. Yeah. Uh, I have what we have now. Well, that's basically it. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, have you revisited Korea no. since the armistice? Okay, no. Um, and uh, if you had life lessons uh, that you wanted to share about your uh, your time in military service, what would what would you feel or what would you say about your your learned experiences from your military service? Don't volunteer. <laughs> um, how has your military service impacted your feelings about war and the military in general? Well, I, I didn't dislike the military. I, mm -hmm. I liked it. Uh, it's no fun being in combat, but other than that, uh, it was an enjoyable experience. Uh, what was the other part of the question? Oh, uh, just, you know, how, the question was, how has your military service impacted your feelings about war and in the military in general? Oh. The military in general, I liked. My feelings about war is that it's a terrible thing. Uh, no one should be subjected to it. It's, uh, well, it's a terrible thing. Um, what message would you like to leave for future generations who will hear or view this interview? Oh, I think the main thing is to be true to yourself, be true to your country. Uh, and uh, freedom isn't free, you have to realize that. And you have to do your part to keep the country moving forward. Absolutely. And is there anything else you feel that we haven't discussed or, or should be added to this interview? Any other uh, memories that you share? Any, you know, they can be funny, they can be serious, they can be, you know, um, advice, it can be anything that you like, else that you would like to share in the interview. Uh, well, you know, there were some funny things that happened, there were some sad things that happened. Uh, it, you know, you see some of your comrades, your troops carried off, uh, wounded or dead is not pleasant. I have some grim memories of picking up bodies of my guys and uh, Put them on the courts to be shipped out. 
back to uh, back to the states, I guess. Uh, hard memories of uh, visiting the mass units after a battle and saying goodbye to the guys, living and dead. Right. Um, and some funny memories of things we did, like uh, stealing a few cases of beer from regiment when they didn't see us. Uh, uh, jokes well, that you guys would play on each other while y'all were out there. Did y'all, did you have any funny jokes that you, you know, any particular person in the unit that y'all didn't necessarily pick on, but always that one guy that always seemed to be the brunt end of most jokes or? No, not really, uh, you know. not, not in the, uh, not in the combat area. Uh, we had a couple of nuts. We have guys who were funny. It's not our purpose. Uh, well, I, I do remember one thing that was kind of humorous. As I mentioned, the patrols, we'd go out on so called ambush patrols. Mm -hmm. uh, we were out on one patrol, and a fellow kept falling asleep, and I kept waking him up. Finally, I said, Look, if you fall asleep again, I'm going to leave you here. He didn't believe it, of course, but when we got up to go, the sergeant said, so I get so-and-so. I said, no, I'm going to sleep a while. Really? I said, yeah, really. So we started to leave, and it started to get light, and the Chinese saw us, and they started you know, shooting some ammunition at us. They weren't really trying to hit us. They were just letting us know they saw us. And that woke the guy up. And <laughs> he started running towards us. And I never saw a guy run as fast in my life. <laughs> but he made it back and he said, God, oh, there'll be people you left me lying there. I told, <laughs> I told you, you I would. <laughs> I told you I would and I did. Lesson learned, lesson learned. So was well, there anything else that you want to share? Uh, I can't think of anything in particular. Okay. Uh, All right. I appreciate you asking me and I hope the interview is a of some use. It was it uh, was it was definitely not only amazing but everything that you have to share yeah. is just so appreciated. So well this concludes our interview and uh, I'm gonna go ahead and put this on pause.